Evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce tonight's talk with Anna Gifty Apoku Ajiman presenting, presenting her anthology, The Black Agenda, Bold Solutions for a Broken System, joined in conversation tonight by Franklin Leonard. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our ever expanding community. We host virtual events like tonight's five times a week. You can find our event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speakers something, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question at any point during the event. We're going to get through as many as time allows for. Also, if you would like closed captions, please click on the live transcript tab on your Zoom screen. In just a moment, I'm going to be posting the link to purchase tonight's featured book, The Black Agenda, in the chat box. Your book purchases make virtual author events like this possible, and they support the future of a landmark indie bookstore. So thank you for tuning in tonight. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as I'm sure you've experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Anna Gifty Apoku Adjaman is an award-winning researcher, writer, and entrepreneur, currently studying public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. In 2018, she co-founded the Sadie Collective, the only nonprofit organization addressing the underrepresentation of Black women in economics, finance, and policy. Her advocacy, research, and commentary have been featured in NPR, Slate, Bloomberg, The New York Times, and several more. Tonight, she is joined in conversation by film and television producer, cultural commentator, and entrepreneur, Franklin Leonard. Chosen as one of the Hollywood Reporter's 35 Under 35, he's the founder and CEO of The Blacklist, a platform which celebrates and supports great screenwriting and the writers who do it. Tonight, they're going to be discussing The Black Agenda, a profound collection of essays featuring Black scholars and experts across economics, education, health, climate, and technology. It's been hailed as bold and unflinching and the first step towards defining Black expertise. Of the book, Ibram X. Kendi writes, this book will challenge what you think is possible by igniting long overdue conversations around how to enact lasting and meaningful change rooted in racial justice. We are thrilled to be hosting this event tonight. So without further ado, Anna and Franklin, the digital podium is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kate. Uh, you can tell how excited I am because I jumped the gun on, on uh, popping my, my video window open. Um, <laughs> look, it's, it's, it's Friday. Uh, it's a good day. And it's in part a good day because I get to have this conversation sort of at the virtual version of my old stomping grounds uh, at Harvard Bookstore. Um, I, I want to hype Anna's book just a little bit more before we jump in. Um, <laughs> if you haven't seen the Kirkus Review, they said that it was an expansive set of essays highlighting the range and force of black leadership, an inclusive, edifying, often fiery assembly of voices articulating the way forward for black America and America in general. Um, and Publishers Weekly called it invigorating and said that policymakers will want to take note and let's, let's hope they do. Um, the last thing I will say about it is uh, if you need any additional confirmation of equality, forward by Tressie McMillan Cottom. Can't really do much better than that. So seriously, when they drop the link in the chat, get your book. I already got mine um, and I'm very excited about it. Um, but before we start, how are you doing, Anna? I, I imagine this is like the first <laughs> ever book tour. Like, where are we in that process? How are you feeling on this Friday? First of all, I really appreciate you asking me that question, by the way. And I'm so excited to be here with you. I, I it's, you know, I don't know, I feel like, still a student I don't know like there's students actually tuned in so hi everyone who's a student um like I had PSATs due so I was just kind of doing my homework um but at the same time it's really exciting to see people engaging with this work and getting excited about black voices and black leadership I think that has been the whole thing and this morning actually two NPR interviews dropped which I wasn't expecting as well so it's like I don't know I oscillate between like 
like normal student life and like this new well, author thing that I'm navigating. Yeah. Okay. So this is the other thing that I want to talk about because you know you sort of hear the recitation of your your bio and your resume. You yeah. Know, you were quite young, um, but and you're also like you know a PhD student at the K school. Um, yeah. And I think that sort of the notion of like a PhD uh, sort of economist gets flattened and like what that means in terms of like where you yeah. have been to get there, like it sort of disappears. It's like, okay, she's a young phenom economist who's gonna like, you know, right. tell us how the world should work. Can you tell us, tell everybody just a little bit of your story? Like, where are you from? Yeah. Where's your family from? Like, yeah. and how did you end up a PhD student at Harvard? <laughs> well, that story is very long. And if you want a little bit more detail beyond what I'm gonna share tonight, please check out those two NPR interviews. Um, and some upcoming interviews that are coming through as well. So, I mean, long story short, on my end, I'm Ghanaian American, though I would say I'm more first generation Ghanaian American, though I was born in Ghana. I came when I was like three months, three months old, excuse me. So my parents and my siblings and my extended family were from Ghana. But that being said, um, when I came to America, I was raised in Maryland and I was eligible for Head Start at a very young age. We work in like a working low income neighborhood. Like I was eligible for that as a result. But what ended up happening was that at the very end of my time at Head Start, I was offered a very unique opportunity. The you know principal at the time of the private school in my area was like, hey, we have an opportunity to offer one student from Head Start a full ride to come to this private school. And I was the student that she selected. And so you can imagine how much of a catalyst that was literally <laughs> in my life. And so that being said, um, I, I kind of got a front row seat in what economic and racial inequality looked like from a very, very young age. And from then on, I, I think I've always tried to grapple with, you know, what does it mean to be in these sort of, um, you know, I would say uh, these gaps in terms of economic opportunity and educational opportunity and how does race and, and gender and all those things play a role into it. Um, so a little bit about me, I graduated from the Glen Oak Country School um, from high school, and then I also proceeded to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where I got my bachelor's in mathematics and minor in economics, and that was really after my pre-med years. We don't talk about that. It was a struggle. Um, organic chemistry really is the worst class, I can attest. Um, and then after that, I actually spent some time at Harvard right after graduation working with a professor, Dr. Peter Q. Blair, and then moved on to work in policy and corporate, and then came back and applied to the PhD program at the Harvard Kennedy School, where I'm currently at. Oh, and, oh, and somewhere in between, I co-founded the Sadie Collective, sorry. I, you, you anticipated my question. Can you please Thank walk you. people through the founding of the Sadie Collective and what that is? Yes, so the Sadie Collective is the first organization to actually center the perspectives and experiences of black women in economics and related fields. And so the purpose of the entire organization is to equip black women with sort of resources to be able to navigate the field of economics and related fields, which is notoriously white, notoriously male, notoriously privileged, and notoriously known for its gatekeeping. And I think several economists who are tuned in are not surprised by anything I'm saying because I've said it before. And so that's essentially what the Sadie Collective does. And we host conferences each year. Um, I'm currently now just the co-founder in name, but I was serving as CEO up until 2020 from 2018. And so that means that you founded it while you when were When I was 21. Grad? Okay, yes. yeah. Just, I was in yeah, college. I wanna, I, wanted, I wanna yeah. let you brag a little bit and sort of put some oh, stuff thanks. on the table. But I think, contextual, I think contextually it's important. The other thing I wanted to flag for people yeah. who don't already know that UMBC uh, has a ridiculous uh, math program. And, 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 and weirdly, that's sort of why I know them and also like a really strong chess team, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, we're nerds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're representing them well, I would say. Thank um, you. <laughs> so why, so I mean, you said you had a front row seat to this stuff, but like why economics? It's, it's, it's easy to imagine other pivots from that, like that sort of context. What was it specifically about economics as a field of study that sort of drew you in? Absolutely. I think for me, um, I've been introduced to this world of politics at a very, very young age. And I mentioned this today that, you know, my dad would take me to kindergarten and would be playing morning edition in the background or rambling about Ghanaian politics or something like that. And so I, I got sort of introduction into like, what does it mean to engage with the world? And what does it mean to question those in leadership? And I, you know, I, I gotta give huge props to my parents who are watching. Hi, mom and dad. <laughs> um, 
for really kind of cultivating that in me. And so that being said, I think that economics, when I had the decision to like, okay, I want to combine something with STEM and social sciences, it seemed like the perfect marriage, right? This idea of using empirical analysis to ask questions about social problems and then, you know, using that empirical analysis to then inform those solutions. And I think that to me, it was like, oh, wait, this exists? Like, I thought, you know, like, I didn't know that this was a thing. And I found out about it when I was like 21, 22. Um, and what was funny about that was I, I grew up on TED Talks. I grew up on, you know, reading political news and The Daily Show in particular. And what I realized was that I've been watching economists my entire life, had absolutely no idea what they were, though. I was like, are they like a riff off of lawyers? Should I go to law school? You know, I had no idea what they were. I mean, that's something I always tell people. I'm like, economics is like one of the best kept secrets. It's a really, really good job. You get paid a lot and people listen to you. So, I mean, like, why not do it, right? And so that's something that has kind of led me to this point. Uh, you're doing a very good job as a spokesperson for the field as well. Um, oh, <laughs> I hope so. so. So how did this book come about? Because again, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm an economist, I study these fields, but this is, you know, the black agenda is a much broader, uh, Absolutely. And more, more ambitious sort of, uh, sort of inquiry. Uh, walk me through, like, how did the book come into being? Yeah. So at the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020, just go back with me for a second. Essentially, what was happening was that there was a lot of news, like an onslaught of news about the pandemic. Obviously, COVID had <laughs> ravaged the world. And people were trying to figure out what's going on and how is it going to affect people. On Twitter, simultaneously, Black experts, folks like Dr. Uche Blackstock, folks like Dr. Chessie McMillan Cotton, were saying, okay, but like, are we thinking about how this is going to affect Black people? That was the prevailing question on the platform. And I noticed that that question wasn't being reflected in mainstream media. And so in particular, as you know, I'm an economist or an economist in training. Let me not say economist before some professor reads me for sales, okay? <laughs> economist in training, right? Um, I asked the question, do black economists matter? Because it seems like unemployment is rising for black populations, but you're not talking to black people. And so there was one mainstream outlet in particular that seemed to have cited a bunch of economists in the month of the first month of the pandemic, but hadn't cited any black economists, which I was like, that we've been here before. Literally 2008 is why, you know, like we we ignored black economists and then we got 2008. And so right. Basically, that led me to pen in um, an article called do, do Black Economists Matter? And should we be listening to them? And basically, the conclusion was like, obviously, they do. The data indicates that we should be listening to them. And it actually was shared by Donna Brazil, who is former chair of the DNC. And so that being said, what ended up happening was on top of that, I, I have a little bit of a platform, right? You mentioned the Sadie Collective. There's oh. certain things I've done in my own sort of short life <laughs> that have gained me a little bit of recognition on Twitter. And so people see me and they're like, oh, she's the more familiar face in the profession. So I'm gonna go to her about my questions. But the truth is like, I don't mind giving you a comment about Janet Yellen. Like she's a, she's a nice chick, you know, she's awesome, <laughs> right? Like I have no issue of doing that. But at the same time, like there are people who are way more qualified to speak on how she would actually impact the macro economy, right? Like I, I my, as I, I, as I tell people all the time, like my expertise only goes so far. And thankfully I'm in a program now that's kind of pushing that. And so basically that combined with the fact that people didn't seem to know where to look, um, led me to think about, okay, what if we just created a platform for black experts to just be in the mainstream? Like, I don't think we're like people saying, I don't know where to look, I don't know where to look. And they're not finding solutions to that problem. Why not just create the solution? And so. The way I thought about it, and I pitched this to my literary agent, I said, Leela, look, I think that if we put all these Black experts into one book and we push the book as far as we possibly can, these individuals are going to be talked about in the mainstream. And just to give you an example of what I mean by that today, as I mentioned before, I was on NPR and I was talking about Dr. Lauren Mims, her research with, you know, Black girl brilliance and how do we center Black girls in the classroom. Apparently, several people reached out to her saying, I heard about you on NPR, I heard about your work. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And that's why this book exists. So I, I read somewhere, it might've been Twitter. Uh, and okay. if you're not following Anna on Twitter, but I highly recommend it by the way, that you sort of viewed yourself at, like in the editor role as the DJ for this book. 
Um, yes. which, which was actually a really interesting analogy that I don't think I've ever heard for an editor of an anthology, but it tracked for me, both knowing sort of the impetus behind it, but also sort of how it turned out. And hoping you can take us through your process a little bit on putting together this sort of proverbial yeah. playlist. Because I think that what, another I one of the interesting that. things about the book is how much the essays are, are in, not directly, but very much in conversation with each other about, yes. you know, and often intention, about a right. broader, you know, black agenda. Absolutely. One thing I want to note for everybody who's listening is that nobody in the book talked to each other before they wrote their essay, aside from those who co-authored their essay, of course, right? Which I think is interesting because despite the fact that they didn't talk to each other, it's almost as if you're sitting at a round table with a bunch of experts and they're riffing off of each other. So the process of finding these black experts was pretty organic. Um, you mentioned to me, you know, how did I think about including all these different topics? Initially, it was just going to be economists and policy wonks. And that was just because that's all I know, right? I just knew about economists and Black economists need to be centered. But this idea paralleled what was happening in the mainstream with respect to Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and then the summer of 2020, where all of a sudden people were thinking about how does racism penetrate different aspects of our society. And then I realized this, is, this has to be a lot more layered because it's not enough to just talk about how the economy um, is, is shaped by you know, racism and, and sexism and underlying um, isms, right? But rather it's really important to bring in these other fields that quite frankly, further contextualize why we are here in the, the state that we are and why black America is suffering disproportionately. And so the way this process went was a little, a, little, um, <laughs> a little creative, a little scrappy, right? So as I mentioned before, I'm a student just kind of figuring things out. And so the first thing I did was obviously reach out to my immediate network. There were several people I was already following on Twitter. I said, look, you already, you've already been talking about this. I would love to feature you in this piece. Some of them said no, most of them said yes. I'll say everybody who said no just said they, did, they couldn't do it because of capacity, which for me was a really, really good sign. Like, okay, I think we're on the right track. And then what ended up happening was I literally did cold calls on Twitter. And if you were following me on Twitter during the summer of 2020, you saw that I was like, hey, does anybody know like a black epidemiologist? Because I don't, I do right? remember, I do remember, remember this, that. Yes, yeah. I do. And it was because, you know, like you can look up black epidemiologists, but like none of them like really pop up, like, you know, folks who are doing the work and that's mm -hmm. part of the problem that we're trying to address. So my hope is that, you know, now that when people are looking at black epidemiologists, they can see, oh, you know, um, Dr. Dara Mendez and Dr. Jules Scott and all these individuals who are, right. you know, in this book are also going to be the ones that pop up when you search these individuals up. So I would say that's sort of how the process went. And of course, collecting all the essays, making sure we do that systematically. Every essay was edited like three, four, five times. And so what you're getting is really a nice refined part of, uh, sorry, nice refined version of the work that people were presenting. And what I'll say is that was the biggest challenge taking academic speak and bringing it all the way down to layman. And I think that was a really good mess with the flex as well as somebody who's coming through the profession. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we are doing Q&A. If you want to hop to the Q&A uh, window, you can ask questions there. I'll be, we'll be sort of pulling questions out uh, not too far from now, because I like to do more of a back and forth. So please ask questions. I think if, you, if it's not obvious already, Anna's pretty willing to talk about anything and usually has a great yes. answer for everything. <laughs> so um, do hop in the chat and uh, ask questions. Um, so I'm going to ask a sort of dumb, broad question. I'm just curious sure. how you're going to answer it. Like, what no question is, the, is dumb, Franklin. This one might be, I mean, because you literally wrote a book about it, but like, what is the Black agenda? Like, like give, me, give me the short version, like not the cliff notes, but like, you know, the elevator pitch. What is the Black agenda in 2022? The Black agenda is Black experts using evidence to justify the value of Black life. That's the Black agenda. So the idea here is across every sector of society, Black life matters. And the folks in this book and Black experts across the country ultimately are using the evidence that they've been able to generate to prove that is the case. So making a case for why Black life matters. Got it. And, and then given that, is, is there, I mean, I know the answer to this, but like, is there a single Black agenda? Is it possible Obviously for there to be a not. single Black agenda? Exactly. Obviously so not. So talk yeah. to me then how you manage that reality. Like, like, like they're like, absolutely not. 
but here's a book called The Black Agenda. Like, how do you exactly manage right. that inherent tension? Just as, an, yes, as a curator I, I love, and an editor. Right. Yes. I love that question. Um, and, you know, if I could rename this book, I would call it A Black Agenda, really, because it's mm. one of many. Um, and in the very, very beginning of the book, both Dr. Cobb and I talk about how this book is not exhausted, right? It's an attempt to bring a bunch of Black experts together. And even experts in this sense, right, is very much limited to advocates and activists and folks who are researchers and folks who are in policy. But there are people who are literally like on the ground, like folks who are working as custodians, folks who are working as teachers, business folks. So I think that if I were able to expand the, the Black agenda beyond just what we have here, it would include a lot more professions for sure. Um, and I will say really quickly that the National Urban League actually releases a report every single year that kind of does this. So this is kind of an iteration of that, but for the mainstream and for trade audiences. What does it look like if the Black, if, if we succeed, right? Like what does it look yeah. like if, if we're able to, we're, 20 years from now, you know, we're back here, hopefully in person at the Harvard bookstore and yeah. we're thumbing through chapter by chapter and we're like, oh my God, like we did it. Right. What, what is that? I mean, I, I've been a black man in America for 43 years. That's more yeah. open expectation. But let's imagine for a moment that that happens. Like what, what, what does the world look like in your mind? Yeah, I really like this question as well. And I think that when you think about even the black agenda essays and how they're constructed, every single essay ends with what this world could look like or what this country could look like if black life is fully realized and fully dignified. And so that would be the first thing that black life is dignified and honored. And it's not, a, it's, it, you know, being black is not criminalized in America. That's the one thing that I would say is a common thread through every single essay in this book. You see that criminal justice pops up again and again and again. And it's because black life at this moment, it's, it's kind of, it's illegal to be black right now, right? right? Like if you're, if you're black and you're walking around, you could get shot, you could get harassed, you could get harmed and the system wouldn't really check it, right? And so right. I think if we were to say, what would progress look like 20 years from now? I wanna be able to be a black person just walking around, minding my business. Nobody's talking about, oh, no, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it's just yep. black people being able to exist freely and having the full benefit of that while systems are also calibrated to ensure that black life is protected and sustained. That's what I think the next 20 years would look like. And if I were to be more specific, that would mean, you know, healthcare dis disparities are eliminated. We have a more diverse workforce that's reflected both in healthcare and in other places. Disabled folks and folks who are, you know, differently abled are being accustomed to, and it's not like an afterthought, right? Um, we're right. thinking about climate, right? The climate justice movement isn't just sort of this trend. It's actually part of literal policy that informs how we think about different decisions with respect to our economy, with the respect to businesses and jobs and that sort of thing. And so I think that that is, that is ultimately what I would see in terms of 20 years and this working out. If all, all the ideas or even some of these ideas are implemented, I can see that black life would be fully realized in this country. I mean, it's interesting. You talk about all these things that, that in a vacuum are not necessarily explicitly parts of what a lot of people I think would assume as a black agenda, right? Climate, climate justice. Uh, you know, disability, yeah. visibility, uh, accessibility, and rights. Um, I would mean, probably I, I add LGBTQ plus rights in that category. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's almost as if what you're saying is, is that by, by fully recognizing Black life and doing so successfully, we accomplish all these other things that are profoundly beneficial to a lot of people who aren't Black. Yeah. Am, am I putting, I don't, want, I, would, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Oh, no, no, like that's I'm exactly saying. right. That's exactly right. The way I would phrase it is, the best outcome for Black people is a better outcome for everyone else. And if you think about there's, these there's, essays- There's the quote right there. These essays say, the best outcome for Black people in climate, the best outcome for Black people in health, the best outcome for Black people elsewhere, yields better outcomes for literally everyone else. And so if we think about, for example, um, you know, Dr. Monica Miglamore's essay around medical, um, the medical, uh, fields hierarchy where doctors are prioritized over nurses that affects everybody and so what she's yeah. saying is like look the way y'all have constructed this is fundamentally racist and classist how about you dismantle that and let's actually channel some literal resources towards ensuring that hbcus are funded 
ensuring that you know we have different mechanisms to um, ensure diverse work workforce and and ultimately that means that you have better doctors you know better health practitioners and imagine if we had you know more you know doctors right i think one thing that she mentions in her essay is that there's something called the flexner report that actually led to the shutdown of several schools um, medical schools that you know would educate black and brown medical professionals and if they had stayed open we would have had 200,000 more black doctors today that's substantial <laughs> okay yeah. like that's yeah. substantial yeah no i mean look I, my, my father was maybe the third black student at the medical college of georgia and the stories that i heard trying to run him out of the school yeah. uh and i think about just the sort of loss of him as a pediatrician a military pediatrician at that right uh and then you you know you put that at scale with the number of folks who've been run out of the profession yep. or under invested in in the profession in in medicine alone you start to think about the scale of the failure for everybody and not just the people right. who necessarily be practitioners um let's talk about critical race theory um <laughs> everybody He's talking about it these days, right? Yeah. Um, I'll also add, if you do have questions, hop in the Q&A box. But um, yeah. what, what, what is going on here, Anna? I, I, I want to ask sort of that very broad question, because yeah. I, I think I had heard of it several years ago. I was aware of what it was, because it was something that sort of lived in a realm that I, I, I was personally invested in. Right. If you told me a couple of years ago that it would be on literally everyone's lips, uh, and a sort of, you know, war zone, really sort of about education, free yeah. speech, all these other things. What, what's your take on what's actually happening here? Yeah, so for those who don't know, CRT basically is a framework to think about how our legal system has racism embedded inside of it, right? So that's kind of how CRT is, is functioning and it's often taught in law schools. So that's the definition of CRT. Let's just put that to the side. Now, for what's happening, CRT is essentially being used, or critical race theory is essentially being used as a boogeyman, right? In terms of, you know, <laughs> it's being used as a way to justify the expulsion of Black stories and, more importantly, the full history of America, right? I think people are very much uncomfortable with the fact that, you know, if you were to unveil the true history of America, certain people wouldn't look good. And in this case, white people, right? And you don't want to be associated with something that doesn't look good. I really understand that. I think what is happening, though, is that there is a severe lack of empathy going on. So what do I mean by that? You say that you don't want, <laughs> you don't want the full history taught because you don't want to look bad. But literally, generations of Black and brown kids have had to go through the education system and learn about very limited parts of their history that are only bad. And so there's this fundamental, I would say, disconnect between, you know, how do you think about the full context of American history? And then how does that, how does that interact with the current powers that be, right? The current powers that be don't want to look bad. They don't want it to make it seem like, oh, I'm upsetting my constituents, right? Like that's essentially what's going on here. But the truth of the matter is that we cannot move forward if we don't grapple with the past. And that's something that we need to do honestly. And that's why folks like Nicole Hannah Jones and, and Kimberly, um, Kimberly um, Crenshaw, these individuals who have been, in my opinion, sort of uh, pioneers in how we think about these questions, like they, ha they have to be at the center of the conversation, which goes back to the ethos of the Black agenda, bringing Black experts to the center of the conversation. Uh, how's, the Har how's the Harvard thing going for you so far? You mean like school? <laughs> I mean like school. Like, what's it like to be a Harvard student? It's been a long time since. Yeah. Was, so like, what? But like, how's that? How's that going? Yeah, I think it's good for the most part. Um, I will say candidly that, you know, being at Harvard is a very surreal experience, and I kind of try to explain to my friends at home, like, it's like you can just be like walking around, and then you like run into Coach Kerr at, from the Warriors. Like that's. That's the kind of, and that literally happened to me. I was waiting for somebody. I saw Coach Kerr was coming. I was like, okay. And then I, yeah. I met Coach Kerr that same day, which I thought was ridiculous, right? But as my um, former therapist told me, Harvard's not real in that like <laughs> what happens here is not what happens in real life. And so I'm embracing it for all of its good and bad, but I'm also hoping that I can find ways to empower other individuals to come here or find different pathways 
um, that allow other individuals to, to benefit from its resources? No, I think it, it's funny that you describe it that way. I, I remember yeah. uh, being on campus and like running from the library to class because I was late and literally like turning the corner and like physically almost running directly into Tabo and Becky um, wow. who was like on campus for a speech. And you just have those moments where you're like, what is oh, happening? Right. That's, yeah. that's just <laughs> real life. But, but I also think, you know, there will be people sort of walking around campus being like, oh, there, there's that woman that, 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 that edited that book, The Black Agenda. Oh, no. <laughs> It'll happen, give it time. Um, I, I'm gonna bounce to, to one of the questions from Danielle. What was your favorite part about the process of bringing this book to life? That's and we talked a lot question. about the how, but like, what was, what was, what was, like, was there a moment in the process of doing it where you were just like, you know, a little bit like running into Steve Kerr on campus, where you were just like, I can't believe this is my life. They're, 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 like, yeah. someone, someone's yeah. paying me to do this. This is incredible. Um, well, first of all, any moment the experts turn things on time was a great moment. So let's just start there. Um, but I'd say the moment that for me, I was like, wow, like, I think what we did here is bigger than what I thought was I, when I actually got to read the book as a reader, right? So I like, as of right now, I've been reading the book and editing the essays and thinking about them from more of a critical perspective, but having the book in front of me and being like, oh, wow, like this is a real thing. It actually has my name on it, right? There's several people who were involved. Um, and the essays in here are actually really, really good. Like purely objective for my part. I'm trying to be objective, but- <laughs> so, but I mean, it'd be weird if like, you were like, I don't know, I edited this thing. So no, it's trash, no. It's trash, yeah. <laughs> No, it's really good. Like, there's a lot of great evidence here. There's a lot of jumping off points here. It's not going to give you the exact playbook to solving the world's problems. And I think there was one critique on uh, one of the trade interviews, um, trade reviews, excuse me, that was like, this lacks specifics. And I'm like, of course it does. We're not about to walk you through, like, how to do this. Like, you had 400 years to figure this out. Right. What we're showing you is a snapshot of what could be. And that's, for me, like, seeing all of the contributors get excited about it, like that for me has been the highlight of this entire process. Can you talk a little bit about what, I mean, I think people, A, number one, read the book, uh, but two, coming out of the book, are there things yeah. that individuals and organizations should be thinking about in terms of what they can be doing to sort of implement the agenda? And I ask that question specifically because like you said, there's no book that's gonna give us the roadmap. If there was someone probably would have written it, right? Yeah. But, it, all of these sort of conversations, all of these essays, this book serve as a jumping off point for the way we go back out into the world after having read it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what are the things that you hope that people sort of take with them in back into the world from the book, right? Because we're not yeah. gonna take every word of every essay, but there are definitely mm -hmm. things that we can take thematically, point like worldview wise, those things. Like, what are the things that you hope will continue to ring in people's ears after having finished it? Yeah. So there's a couple of big things that I would say, first and foremost, the first being that right now, the fact of the matter is it's, a, it's, it's, it's illegal to be black in America. That's the fact, like I'm not making that up. So if you look at the stats, for example, like incredibly difficult to navigate America and it's crane policing system, make it out alive. Right. Those are the facts. You make it out alive or be in prison, especially if you're a black man. So that's something that I want people to think about as you are moving forward, because when people say, oh, abolish the police or, you know, reinvest things, like you need to understand what context they're operating under. There's a difference between studying racial inequality and living through it. And I think a lot of times the people who are talking about racial inequality oftentimes sit in the former. And so it's not enough to do that. You have to understand that there are individuals who sit in the former and the latter, and they have a lived experience that is further justifying the evidence that they're hoping to find. So that's one thing I will say. The second thing is that we've been talking quite a bit about climate in the mainstream, in the public discourse, and I think there's an essay titled by Mary Anise Hagler, where she talks about stop all lives mattering the climate crisis. I 100% agreed. She actually might have the only title in the essay that I did not tweak. I didn't touch that from the moment she submitted it because it was super succinct. 
<laughs> the idea here is that like Earth Day, we're gonna talk about the Earth, but we're not gonna talk about how black and brown people are being disproportionately affected by climate on the Earth, right? That's that's safe for Juneteenth. Why are you trying right. to silo these issues, right? They're very much integrated. They're very much related. Um, and that, you know, that space in particular needs to spend quite a bit of time reflecting and seeing why is your entire employee list 40 shades of beige? Something is wrong because your community is not going to be as harmed by this as your black counterparts or, you know, your brown counterparts. And so if you're not finding a way to integrate their perspectives and critiques and, and thoughts into your space, then you have failed in thinking about how this climate justice movement is going to move forward. So that's the other thing I'll mention. I think the one that's more pertinent is, you know, what's happening with health and what's happening with education. In both cases, you absolutely have to think about the role that marginalized people play in the system. And so what do I mean by that? Like, it's not enough to be like, oh, we're just gonna provide anti-racism education and we're done. It's absolutely imperative that you think about how students are internalizing systemic views of them, how you can then combat that in the classroom. So one essay kind of lays that out very clearly, Dr. Lauren Mims, who I've mentioned quite a few times over the past week, she talks about how you know black girls in her classroom were saying disparaging things about themselves and she had to literally cross it out on the board and say no these are not things that you should be believing about yourself and so she kind of gives you a playbook as to step by step how do you intercept those harmful beliefs that black and brown students might be um you know uh internalizing in your class and it doesn't necessarily need to be at the elementary school level it can be at the college level it can be at the graduate school level and so thinking about how that interacts. And similarly, thinking about how healthcare is then impacted by the lack of Black doctors and the lack of Black nurses, et cetera, that has substantial impact on the quality of care. And so Dara Mendez and um, Jules Scott talk about, you know, we need a new praxis of how we think about healthcare. It cannot be siloed from economic justice. It cannot be siloed from criminal justice. There needs to be some way to think about it um, that is holistic and ultimately encompassing of different aspects of society. And the last thing I'll say, just in the context of what has recently happened, um, as many people know, Miss USA recently committed suicide. And I don't mean to be a trigger for anybody. Um, but that being said, there is an essay in the book about how mental health matters for Black America. I believe it's called uh, Mental Health for Black America, where Dr. Javay Grooms literally lays out how mental health and how we think about mental health in the Black community is directly tied to the criminal justice system. If you are undermining Black folks in their most vulnerable state, then of course you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna basically undermine us in any other state. And so there needs to be a robust investment into mental health resources. So again, if you you know want to check on your Black friends, I think doing so in a way that is honoring their life is of top priority for sure. I mean, that, those are phenomenal answers. There's sort of Thank one follow-up I want to ask that touches, I, yeah. I think, on most of them. I mean, look, as a young Black woman with a big brain working in a predominantly white male field, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about the climate, uh, you know, the climate movement and how it is, how it is, at least in the public eye, overwhelmingly white. Um, yeah. And then there are a lot of Black and brown women who are doing work behind the scenes. Um, I think the same thing is true in, in STEM. I think we're finally starting to see and, and, and learn the names of the folks who are sort of on the front lines in that regard. And I think your book goes a, a long way towards introducing us to some of those names. The experience of being a Black woman in those, in those situations, can you talk a little bit about both the reality day to day of navigating it, but also what needs to change so that there can be more, like, because here's the thing, that I know for a fact there are other Annas out there who might not Absolutely. necessarily get that first shot right after Head Start, might not be right. able to make the jump from UMBC to Harvard, right. but, but you and I both know they're out there. Just like I know there are other Franklin Leonard's out there who, who yeah. frankly do a lot more than I ever will. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that like when, that A, they know that these things exist, B, that once they're there, they know that they're just as entitled and have a right to be there as everybody else. And what can we do to make sure that they succeed? Again, for all of our benefit. Yeah. But like, I, uh, yeah. I think people don't have a clear understanding of like what the day-to-day -day realities of dealing with what you probably have and will continue to deal with navigating what you navigate. Yes. Um, 
so before I like really answer that question in earnest about myself, I think that what you're talking about is best reflected in something that has recently gone on. So in the economics profession right now, there's a huge um, scandal around, um, you know, the confirmation of the Federal Reserve governors. And for those who are not familiar with the Fed, the Fed basically manages the health of the U.S. economy. And so currently Biden has nominated two black individuals and um, one white woman. And the two black individuals, one of them is called Dr. Lisa D. Cook. She's actually my my very dear friend, sister from another mister, mentor, teacher, all those things. And so one thing that's come up with her is that many people are questioning her competence. Of course. And I think that is the day-to-day -day reality. So I can be doing all of these things and somebody will go somewhere and say, well, Anna only got here because of X or Anna only did this because of X. I'm pretty sure there's people who I go to school with who think the only reason I got into Harvard was because I co-founded the Sadie Collective. Like that was one box on my application and all I had to do was check it. And then they say you're in. And I think what people don't recognize is that black folks in particular have to work twice, thrice, quadruple times <laughs> as much as, as white folks and, and, other, and other folks from even other marginalized identities. And I think that it's because people assume, and I think Dr. Ibram Kenny even illustrated this very beautifully on Twitter recently, people assume incompetence is our default. And so when you assume that, I have to work now twice as hard to prove that, first of all, I am competent, and then to then prove that I am competent to you. Right. That is a lot of work, right? I remember when we were putting this book together and I kind of told the team, I said, look, this book is black, black, black. I mean, I'm a black person. The person who's doing the forward is a black person. The people in the book are black people. That being said, like the room for error is really, really small because people are going to already assume a baseline incompetence about even the individual in the book say, well, I didn't think their evidence was strong enough and I didn't think da, 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 da. And I think that for me, that's the day to day, right? Like people just not thinking that I'm enough and people not thinking that I can show up in spaces and, and be myself and, and be all that is. And I think the other thing too that I grapple quite a bit with, like when you are someone like me and I don't like to say it like that, but it's like, you have a platform, you have a book, right? Like people then want to tokenize you and say, well, you're the only example of black excellence in this right. space. There is no other, Anna, right. there is no. And so when I first entered the field of economics, I came in swinging, as you know, and you know, I was like, look, I'm excited that you guys are excited about me being in the field, but guess what? My whole crew is coming. Yep. Went to the co-founding of the Sadie Collective. Now you got thousands of black women who I won't say are like similar to me in any way, they're unique in their own way, but they're bringing their own type of brilliance to the field. And that has absolutely nothing to do with me per se in that I am not, um, I am not sort of the, the prototype for what black excellence looks like in a particular field. And I think that my biggest gripe with folks who are, you know, maybe a little bit more established, a little bit older, is that folks sometimes become gatekeepers of who gets to be black in a certain field or who gets to be black and excellent in a certain field meaning that like it's like we have a limited number of spots all around the table and i've right. allocated these spots to these types of people my whole philosophy and i think i i align greatly with gen z on that is i'm taking a sledgehammer and i'm breaking the table why are we why do we even have a table here in the first place right the table is limiting why can't we use a whole room right this idea of like having inclusive excellence go beyond just a couple seats, right? Like that for me is the biggest thing. Um, and so to your point about creating those pathways, I think for me personally, I am interested in doing research around that. Like how do we get black and brown people into organizations and do it in a way that, you know, <laughs> if you're being racist, it's completely obvious. And I can point to, I'd be like, oh, the evidence right. says that behavior is racist, right? right. Um, but on the tail end of that, and what we've done to the city collective is literally create outside of those existing systems. And I think you, you're you very familiar with this, with the back, blacklist, excuse yeah. me, right? Where it's like, you're creating something that is forcing your hand. Like, I have all the black women, now what are you gonna do? Right. There's a book of black experts, now what are you gonna do? And all of a sudden you have to grapple with, <laughs> am I biased? Or do I have to like give in and showcase right. the black people? In, other, in any way, like we, we learned the truth. Sorry, go ahead. I wanna, I wanna press you on the, the Gen Z sledgehammer to the table thing. Um, yeah. So, so and I'm, I'm going to use uh, Hillary's question in, in the Q&A, sure. 
but I don't, but she had asked it before this context. So to the extent sure. that, this, that, that there's being spin put on the ball, I want to take responsibility for it before I ask. No so you problem. want to take a sledgehammer to the table, but yeah. also inevitably in editing an anthology, there are only so many seats at the table. There are on, only so many essay, essays that you can publish. So again, how does one curate the inevitably limited table? And, and were there any essays, ideas, thinkers that you wanted to include that yeah. for whatever reason you weren't able to, and you don't have to give us names. I think we're all more interested in sort of like the decision-making the processes ideas. around that yeah. rather than the like, oh, I really would have wanted to include this person. Yeah. We don't, um, we, we don't, we don't need the gossip is my point. Oh yeah, there's no gossip by the way too. Um, <laughs> So the first, the first part of the question, when I say sledgehammer to, the, sledgehammer to the table, what I mean really is about expanding access and opportunity. I should not be the only black person in the room and the black people in the room shouldn't just be like me, right? People look at me now and they're like, oh, she's at Harvard. Okay, <laughs> but like at the end of the day, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to bring in people no, I know who are exactly at what you're Morgan saying. State. You know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah. Like we all black and we all doing really awesome stuff. And I think that creating the space for that is, is incumbent on me as the most privileged black person in the room, given my proximity to privilege. And so that's kind of what I was getting at with that. To your point about which I would have wanted to include. I really, really would have wanted to conclude, um, include, excuse me, people who are just working right now, um, working in the sense that you know, they work a nine to five, they're teachers, they're custodians, they're people who are running businesses. I would have wanted a business and entrepreneurship station, um, excuse me, section. I would have wanted more K to 12 teachers, like actual teachers in the education section. Cause I know we're hearing from researchers who have looked at the evidence, mm. but there is also anecdotal evidence that is being gathered on the ground. Um, and here's where I'm gonna plug in Abbott Elementary because it's a really, really good show yes. by Quinta Brunson. Promote, I, yes, let's, pro, let's use every opportunity we can to promote Yes, it's really, it's really, really show. good. I'll let you take it over, but yes, everybody yes. watch Abbott Elementary. Quinta Please. Brunson's amazing. The show is hilarious. Yes. Please watch the yes. show. Take, yes. continue, Sorry. Thank you. Um, and for those who don't know, Quinta Brunson put the show together based on her own experience within the Philadelphia educational system, where she now plays a uh, teacher, she's I, I think she's teaching first grade or second grade. Um, but basically, it's a it's a comedy, but it's also a documentary, quite frankly. So <laughs> that being said, I encourage people who are interested in like educational inequality to definitely check out that show for sure. Even um, even if you even if you don't care about educational inequality at all, if you just want to laugh for a half an hour, watch Abbott Elementary. We're just gonna we're just please, gonna use this please. minute it's to like really get good. A <laughs> um, and so that being said. I think that there, there are people who are, are on the ground that I really, really would have, would have wanted to include. I would have definitely wanted to include more activists and advocates. And so that's what led me then to say, man, there's so many people I would have included. I have limited capacity and limited time. What I'm instead gonna do is curate a recommended reading list that encompasses some of those voices that would have you know, filled in these different gaps. So for example, you know, people were asking me like, where are the creatives? I said, I know, I know there was an essay that I want to include that talked about women in hip hop and politics. And I really wanted to find a place for it and I couldn't. But that being said, you should check out Black Futures, which includes a bunch of Black creatives. And they're expressing sort of these political um, views through art. And so that's kind of what I mean by making space, right? I could have gotten away with having no recommended reading, being like, this is all you need to read. But I think that that's exactly kind of the ethos of what we were talking about before, where it's, it's not just me. There's actually quite a few people here. I highlight the people that you probably might have heard of, um, but there's definitely a lot of people you haven't heard of. And the, and the experts in this book also have their own book, um, own books and own publications that you should absolutely check out as well. So yeah, that's that's the answer to that question. No, I think that's a great, that's a great answer. And just to you know, default to my Hollywood sort of training, sequels, Black Agenda 2, the, that's when you hit up all of the sort of workaday people and it's a whole new spin on, uh, mm. on, 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 on the content. Um, next question, it's either Isa or Issa, I'm not sure, I apologize, um, but our democracy is in peril between the assault on voting rights and gerrymandering yep. and the erosion of truth yep. in public discourse. How yep. optimistic are you about whether you will see the ideas in your book become policy? The critical <laughs> can we question. I think we can. Here's why. When you read the essays in this book, you will kind of take a step back and be like, why aren't we already doing this? because they're practical, right? Like the solutions are very practical. 
So even with respect to voting rights, it really comes down to the passage of you know two acts, right? I think Cliff Albright, who's the the, the co-founder of Black Voter Matters, Bo- Bo- Black Voters Matter, excuse me, um, kind of talks about this, where it's you know the John Lewis Act to sort of think about how voting rights is integrated into um, society, and it's like the Freedom to Vote Act, right? Protecting Black voters as they go to the ballot. But I think the other thing to recognize too is that voting rights ultimately is a catalyst for all the other solutions that are in the book. If Black people can't get to the ballot, then they can't vote about climate, they can't vote about wellness, they can't vote about education, they can't vote about gerrymandering, you know what I'm saying? Like they can't vote about all these different things that ultimately contribute to the injustices that are committed against Black people in this country. And so I love the way that Cliff talks about it. He says, voting rights have always been a Black American struggle. And I'm gonna go ahead and push that even further and say that I was talking to Dr. Keisha Blaine in Detroit earlier this week about this. Black Americans have given Black people globally the blueprint to how to fight for civil rights. And so very much what I believe is that a Black person who is in America, but not necessarily a descendant of an enslaved individual, what I will say is that I have to empower those who are the legacy of those individuals to have their rights, because ultimately their rights serve as a blueprint for how we can advocate for rights in Ghana, how we can advocate for rights in South Africa or the Caribbean. And so I think the idea here is that my hope is that voting rights can be sort of the, the catalyst that sets everything off. We saw very clearly that if you have enough black people voting, yeah. it's blue. I mean, that, and, that, and I think that's why, and, I, but, and then that's why voting rights are the, the sort of front line right now, because right. that has the potential to turn a lot of other things. It's funny, you actually anticipated the follow-up question here, which was, how, if you had to prioritize components of the agenda, what would you, what changes would you like to see first? And I agree with you that voting rights is sort of, is, yeah. is probably the most critical. Up, up most, yeah. So I think we have like three or four minutes left. We are already wow, at the Wow, what? That went by so hour. fast. I mean, that, that's what we that's what we aspire for. I know, in right? Our, in our human <laughs> age, right? Um, so if anybody has any additional questions, now would be the time to put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask one uh, sort of sort of last question. And then if there's anybody that has an amazing question in the chat, we'll use that as the final one. But like, what's next for you, Anna? I know you're going to go back to school. <laughs> um, you have problem sets probably due next Friday. Yes, but like, that's what what's next is, for me. <laughs> But like, as you think about your future, what, yeah. what, what excites you? And I don't mean about the world, I mean specifically about the stuff that you're going to do and that can be professional or other. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things I wanna do and we've been talking about this is finding ways to celebrate and center black people in art and doing that as an extension of the work that I've been you know, putting out there in more of the academic and policy realm. Um, I'm working right now with one of my friends, Lexi Robinson, to find a way to continue the legacy of this book in a very tangible way, right? How do we actually get resources to Black experts who are trying to do this work and trying to push forth these bold solutions? So I think for me, that's like in the immediate, in the immediate future, like what I would want to do. Um, obviously, problem sets, like clearly. I know PhD students probably laugh at that. I mean, I got a metrics piece set due <laughs> like I, on Friday. I, next here, week. Here's what I'll say about this, though. I miss <laughs> problem sets. There is a there's a there's a, a lovely thing about sort of being a student and having problem sets where like you do it and you finish it and you send it off and you're done, right? Yeah. And you get a grade and yeah. that's it. And if there was a version of that, I guess that's like email for me now yeah. as an adult uh, sort of in yeah. the working world. But yeah, if I if I could have some problem sets, I'd be very happy about that. Right. Years. Yeah. But what about like non-work related? Let's put aside the economics. Let's put aside. Like, yeah. What is what does Anna want? Like what's the mm. what's the what's the gift that you'll give yourself when when you're when the book is out and you're done with the book tour and you're like you know what I deserve this what's <laughs> what's the what's the what's the thing yeah so my hope is you know considering all COVID nineteen um, protocols I would love to treat you know my girls to a uh, all expense paid girl trip somewhere um, I think for me that would be like the pinnacle of my joy and then of course you know treat my parents to something as well for, you know, raising a pretty decent human being. <laughs> they did a pretty good job. Shout out to them. Yeah, I know they, shout you out to mom they were listening, dad. Like, bra, bravo and brava on, uh, on being, being Anna's parents. Um, and everybody buy the book. The link is in the chat. Help Anna take her girls on a vacation. 
Um, buy, buy them for your friends, buy them for anybody who probably needs to be better educated on the black agenda, which is a whole lot of people in America. Um, and I guess with that, we'll turn it back over to Kate. Um, thank, thank you so you much. So much for this opportunity. Uh, like I said, this kind of conversation with this kind of person on a Friday, what more can I ask for? Likewise, the feeling is definitely mutual. Thank you so much, Franklin. My pleasure. And Anna, are you taking applications for that all expenses paid girl trip? <laughs> no, right? <laughs> Seems like a pretty good time. You got at least one fun person to hang out with. <laughs> um, well, thank you tremendously to Anna and Franklin for sharing this powerful, just, just incredibly well-spoken conversation with us. I feel like for this author series or this event series, I think that it exists so that we can have conversations just like this and ideally more conversations like this, like you were talking about. So I'm so appreciative of both of you and I'm sure our attendees are as well. Um, thank you to all of you out there for spending your evening with us. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, have a great night, keep reading and please be well. Thank you.